That was really great. Thank you again for that. Um, would the panelists for the next session come on stage? And I think we're going to also add a chair. So we'll be ready in just a minute here. Is Aaron here? There you are. This is you. Love it. Okay, so um, I've introduced myself. I'm still Dina. And um, we're going to have a quick conversation here about um, something that Michael talked about in the opening. We know how powerful music is. We know how important it is to us as human animals and in community. And we also know that the economic infrastructure doesn't really fit that, right? There's a, there's a fundamental misalignment. Um, however, I am flanked by some people who've done some pretty thoughtful and creative things in that area. So we're gonna explore today, um, how can we better support artists? How can we enhance public access? And how can we support those small businesses that are a vital part of the music uh, ecosystem? And so rather than my blathering on, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to give a quick self-introduction and then we'll jump right in. Aaron, can I pick on you to start? Yes, my name is Aaron Myers. I'm a, a jazz artist by trade <clears throat> and I'm an arts administrator. I'm the executive director for the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. I have to give a shout out to my fellow director, Ms. Laura Curry, for the Idaho uh, State Art Agency. Uh, we were just together in Santa Fe, and so that's what I do. I'm on the Board of Governors with the Recording Academy and a grant uh, voting member as well. Welcome, thanks for being here. Hi everyone, Sean Keithley uh, here with the City of Boise Mayor's Office. I'm the Director of Economic Development and uh, have the privilege of working closely with uh, folks in our community uh, including folks from the uh, the artist community as well as in the public sector uh, and um, like to give a shout out as well to our uh, other partners and staff here from the city of Boise um, notably arts and history department uh, Jennifer Stevens and Tilly Bubb right up front here thank you it's always a privilege to work with you on this and all things creative economy hi um, hi everyone I'm Jamie Duffy I'm from Denver Colorado I've been the longtime executive director of a creative youth development organization in Denver called Youth on Record. And about two years ago, we became, excuse me, the co-owner of our region's largest independent music festival called the Underground Music Showcase. Um, in addition to that, I work at the intersections of public policy, advocacy for artists, um, creative youth development, and I myself am an artist, though not a musician. Uh, and I'm uh, the other Jamie, uh, uh, less, <laughs> less, less uh, established, but I'm Jamie Van Leeuwen. I'm the global uh, CEO and founder of the Global Livingston Institute um, out of Denver, but we work in Uganda and Rwanda, uh, and we've had a music festival there um, for about 10 years. Uh, and I had actually the pleasure of traveling with Jamie to East Africa in the nascent uh, stages of our development. And I'm just very excited to be here and to be in Boise today. So thank you. Yeah, we're really glad to have all of you here. Aaron, once again, I'm going to pick on you by giving you the first question. So I know that you have been in your role not all that long but you've been a musician and an advocate and a community builder for many years. But now that you're at uh, the DC Arts Commission, I'm curious about your thinking. W what do you think local government can do um, to increase access to music for the public? What do you think, um, is there a role for local government in terms of supporting small business? Well, first, we have to acknowledge that all artists, uh, especially musicians, are small businesses to begin with. Okay, so there's no such thing as a local artist. That, that's ridiculous. You are a, for if you're in Washington, D.C., you're a D.C.-based artist. If you're in Boise, you're a Boise-based artist or an Idaho-based artist. You, are, you choose to place your business in a locale, and your art itself has worldwide impact. So this is something that you do to move past the imposter syndrome and 
all this other stuff on both parts of the artist and also the government. Uh, the, the government doesn't often understand how to um, include, as far as the economic development uh, plan, that of the creative economy. Mm -hmm. The creative economy is usually an addendum, something on the back part, or it is couched uh, to be encompassed all in one agency, and then state art agencies are left to figure out from a nonprofit level sometimes, or with weird statutory requirements, how we then are to competitively and fairly use public funds to support uh, uh, individual artists. Um, it's important that government um, creates an environment for the private sector to thrive, compete, and innovate. So that means if musicians <clears throat> do not have an environment to either do their work, which means perform, uh, have spaces to uh, rehearse, uh, practice, uh, places to purchase interest, instruments, um, uh, an economy that deals with uh, good marketing to support and to uh, let the public know what assets the city has, um, for instance, does the city uh, encourage an environment that, uh, that supports a marketing uh, a strategy or a marketing bla a blast like a supermarket or like a new store that's opening or a new sports place that's opening as they do the DC or the uh, 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 state-based artists that they have there as well? So when we think about what the city could do or what the state could do to increase access to the public for these artists, we have to really step back all the way at the beginning and say, well, first of all, what cost benefit does the artist have by doing this particular thing? I mean, we just heard in the previous panel, uh, basically artists saying, well, there's ways we can do this without money or there's ways we can invest our time. I am so sick and tired of that. We just lived through the pandemic we saw how fast and how beautifully large swaths of money can go where you need it. We also lived and saw if those of us in 2008 or those of us in 99 and 2001 when uh, both the dot com crashed and cars uh, we were too big to fail. What we do need to see is the music industry to do something similar as it did with Neva and the rest of them, not only with independent venues, but with individuals to come together and to become an effective lobby. So to approach, thank you. So that you can approach people like me who are in government with the plans already written, the solutions there. Do not go to someone in, in government and ask for their, their solution. I, w I walked into a government building one year uh, with a saxophone player and the security guard th thought that was a trumpet. You know, no one in that building has a solution for you, and do you think that the beef industry, or the oil industry, or the cigarette industry, the tobacco industry, or the retail industry, or the restaurant industry, or the hotel industry goes to government for solutions and asks them how do we get more access? They walk in with the bill written. They've done their research. They've come together. They know that they'll compete down the line, but right here we are, we are one of one voice. And then they say, I want you to vote for it. And not only did they do that, they identified who their funders were and who their stakeholders were to make sure they were also calling those who were in government to make sure when it came down to vote, these things happened. And if you have a state that has a governor, in my case, it's a city with a mayor, you talk to the people who speak to them and make sure they do what they need to do to get it passed. If it is a sound and equitable thing, I would say. You're echoing a lot of the things that we heard from Council President Halliburton earlier, that you know, doing some of the work before you make the ask makes all the difference. It's necessary. If you come to, if coming to my office, we in government, we're not in a place to be thought partners with you. Right. We are prohibited. You are prohibited. So we can only offer the best way that this process could possibly be executed that you've given to me, but there has to be some organizing. This crabs in a barrel foolishness that I've worked years in Washington to get rid of, if all of us ain't got no money, what are we fighting for, mm -hmm. right? What we need to be doing is strategizing for more access to the private sector dollars, and to be quite frank, not to be as dependent upon government. Because in some, in some spaces, that thwarts the, uh, the, the, the progress, uh, the viability, uh, the ingenuity, the innovation uh, that you get naturally from when you have sparked the private sector to take mm -hmm. care of its business. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So that's it. Well said. Thank you. So, Sean, you're also in local government, and uh, you're with the city of Boise. No small part of why we are in Boise is because of the thriving creative economy. Um, and I want to put the same question to you. What, how, how has the city thought about uh, expanding public access to music and also supporting the small businesses that are, as Aaron points out, sometimes the musicians themselves, but the other small businesses as well that are part of that ecosystem? Well, thanks, Dina, and thank you, Aaron. Um, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad that you're um, making the points that you just did. Um, really, you know, it's about, it's about shining this question back on the audience, and that's where I'm gonna channel my energy from, because it is about empowerment. Uh, it is about um, all of the people that we work with. When we're in government, we're taking, um, and, and I will say, you know, we, we do work as thought partners, but we, uh, we need to have that empowerment come uh, from the community and, uh, and, and, and to be able to take that uh, to our networks, to those, to those funders that are out there that we have, that are part of that broader network that we have access to and that we're in leadership positions to um, help shift. Uh, that needs to come from our community, so, uh, and we welcome that. Um, but all that being said, yes, we're in the business as a city uh, or in city government, um, you know, broadly speaking, it's, it's like, you know, you're in charge of infrastructure. And part of that infrastructure, uh, when we talk about the creative economy, is cultural infrastructure. And there are so many pieces of that. And your, your job is to um, help orchestrate how that comes together and then find creative ways um, to build support for it, uh, build funding mechanisms, and then to some extent, um, be a partner and step aside and let the, let the community do its work. So um, to one of, again, to one of Aaron's points about uh, things like, like direct funding, um, it's important that we have some of that, but we're also limited in how much of that we can do, especially here in Idaho. And uh, it's, it's great that we have an arts and history department, for example, in our city that has direct funding programs to help things like uh, in their early days, Tree Fort to, to get its legs and um, to be able to grow to what it is now. And uh, we still have a, a vibrant program that's, uh, you know, our 1% for the Arts program, our, our direct grant program. That's all great and, um, and it helps a lot of artists in our community. Um, but also, getting back to this idea of creating infrastructure, um, we heard uh, Hunter say, I, th I think it was the idea of um, uh, democratization of public space. And you have, as a city, a lot of public space that uh, you're, you're, you have purview over. And how you use that public space, how you think about it, how you design it, and then how you engage your partners uh, in, say, like the development in the real estate community to think about how they complement that public space with uh, a venue they might have, a, uh, a new office building, uh, a historic district. I mean, all of that's so important when you think about these things holistically and how they come together, how you integrate those things with public art, how you design your streets. Uh, you, you, when you start engaging your, um, your, your planning and building department on this idea of uh, festival streets, for example, and you think about those rights of way as places for per performance and for uh, things that go beyond just, just transportation. Um, those things can come together to help build vibrancy in your city. And then as you program them and you think about them um, in, in your partnerships with the cultural, you know, your, the artists in your community, um, you can really create vibrancy in ways that are unexpected. Um, and then you also work to help, like I said, you know, program these things with the folks in your community who do that. We have, I th believe we have our director of our Downtown Boise Association here, Jennifer Hensley, who um, last night, and she runs our first Thursday program. She runs something called a Live After Five and programs something like 90 events year round. And we do that in the public spaces that we have uh, available uh, for those things to happen. So all, all that's super important. We have a neighborhood concert series um, that, uh, again, our arts and history department is part of. We've also partnered with Morrison Center and St. Luke's and a local brewery to, um, to dem democratize our public parks across the city. Uh, for neighborhood concerts and um, and to help program that. So really, a lot of it's about creating the space, and um, and then making sure that you're available uh, to to further the partnerships to to grow that and create support. Yeah, that's can, so smart. That's can so, I just add yeah, one thing do. to that really quick, which is, you know, thinking about we hear a lot, and this is for musicians out there who might be 
um, a little confused about how to do what these two guys are saying, right? So to concretize this, we need to, as musicians, get involved in sectors that aren't the arts. And so my recommendation, right, because we will hear a lot, like there's not enough arts funding. Maybe there's not, but there is a lot of public health and safety funding, and there's housing funding, and there's transportation mobility funding. And so my recommendation if for artists, arts communities who are listening online, watching online here today, like how do I even start? Um, every city has commissions and boards, and my recommendation is that we get artists on every board and commission, not just the arts boards and commission. So really locally reach out, try to figure out like, don't sit on your arts boards, like sit on your transportation board, your public health and safety boards, right? Those people will get to know you and they will be delighted to give you some money, right? Because you're gonna be the sexiest thing going. Um, anyway. Yeah. No, that's great, that's yeah. so smart. And, and I also, I loved what you said, Sean, about the infrastructure and how that makes uh, an environment that's more open to music. Erin, go. Well, she said something that was that's very important. We just left the NASA conference, and one of the ideas that was thought uh, that was brought up in the executive directors, um, that's the National Association for State Art, National National Assembly of State Art Agencies. Something that was brought up was uh, the term of the a resident artist and thinking of all the agencies, both from a state level and also from a city level. Yes. So, you know, you, this is you reaching out to your Department of Health, Department of Transportation, uh, Veterans Affairs, so on and so forth. Who is your resident artist and what would that resident artist, how can I shape that program? How much money do I need to make sure that's going to happen? But then, don't stop with just getting the check from the government or from the public side. Think about from a private side, how do I take this seed and then plant it to grow it so that it is actually sprouting into something that's even bigger yeah. than this. And then how do I make this a model so that I, I can call my friends in Louisiana, in Texas, wherever, and say, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what I'm doing here. How can you all do the same thing where you are? That's, that right there is amazing. And sitting on those, uh, those boards and those trusts and this, that, and the other, it ensures that you as an artist has a seat at the table yeah. as they're making these plans. Once, since I've taken this position, Washington D.C. is engaged in this huge thing about revitalizing downtown. That means empty buildings, and I'm sure there are empty buildings in all the cities that we go to. So what we're doing now, we're trying to pair uh, artists, our grantees, over 1,400 of them, with uh, available space in Washington, D.C. That's ranging from retail space uh, to pop-up space to rehearsal spaces, that and the other. We did a space needs assessment that we're preparing uh, for the deputy mayor so we can do a pair-up. All this is great. This costs my agency nothing, but what it does, it tears down the intimidation of the process and making sure that you have a seat at the table. If you are in a position like mine, your goal, your job is to ensure that your artists and the, your clients have a seat at the table. Right. Because I am an artist and I have usually brought my own folding chair to most tables I've had to sit at. <laughs> Now that I've been invited to this particular table, I have, I'm seeing that we have not had a seat there or a voice there for such a long time. Usually, when plans are brought up, we're not even an addendum. For everybody who plays in a restaurant right now, I guarantee you, you are not a part of the business plan. Right. That's why they can't pay you the money that you need, and that's why they can't market you. You're not a part of the plan to begin with. And just like when we talk about grants and the granting programs, and although the agency that I do, we give out over $38 million in grants a year, granting is racist. Mind you, I'm one of three black people in this room of four, okay? So when we think about how grants and access has been made to uh, the arts, we, we use the model of being a starving artist. We appreciate the art because it came from pain and struggle and hurt and da 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 da. And once it, we've seen and we can authenticate the pain and we can inflict the pain by putting all other processes and clean hands or make sure your taxes are this, that, and the other, and then we can possibly give you half the money up front and then wait. Uh, 60 days after the thing is done to give you the rest. All these bears, these are, these are uh, racist uh, systems that keep people of lower economic statuses from getting the access to what they need. Let's just say the quiet part out loud, right? Our goal in government, those of us who are there, are to try to make sure that we bring that, try to bring equity to the playing field mm -hmm. as much as possible. But as I'm bringing equity to the playing field or doing my job to, it can't stop 
fair because she then must take off the, the excuse of, well, they've always been in, in the way. Once we move out of the way, take and run and build with it and know how to value your time and how to create a plan, know how you're measuring success so that at the end of the day, we can see something that comes out of it. The reason why a lot of these for-profit businesses or whatever keep getting the same contracts is because the city can see the results of the money that they give them immediately. Sometimes we give out grants to artists or art organizations and they come to us the next year for the same amount of money. And the only thing I can see is the same thing they did last year. Well, that means that you, there's no growth, you know? And if there's something else we can do, there's possibly another solution, let's hear that. But so far, I'm, I'm not seen it. I love that. I'm and, sorry, and go ahead. No, 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 mm -hmm. I wanna actually play off of something you, you talked about, the, 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 the pain of the artist and oh, the, yeah. the starving artist. And Jamie, um, in one of the showcases, uh, I, I noticed that you, you made a statement about the, what is it, the transformative power of treating the artist as a client. Mm. Could you talk a little bit about how that looks? Yeah, you know, when we purchased, when Youth on Record purchased the Underground Music Showcase, I was trying to take the best practices that I knew from our organizing at Youth on Record. And the client at Youth on Record is our young creatives, right? Like that is what we are in the business to do. And so it kind of seemed like madness to me to look at music festivals who weren't centering artists as the client, but were actually centering music fans as the primary client. I love music fans, and music fans are the reason that we have such a robust arts and culture scene in the state of Colorado and the city of Denver. They essentially fund arts and culture for our city. Um, but putting artists as the primary client allowed our festival to be mission-based and to really serve our purpose, right? And one of our purposes is artist care. So a couple of things you'll see it at UMS, and I know we've got we've to move on to other stuff, but at the Underground Music Showcase, what you'll see as of the last couple years, um, we actually wrote into our uh, LLC co-purchase agreement, a thriving artist wage. Um, so it's not a suggestion. It's a, this is the minimum and if we don't hit that minimum, we are kind of out of compliance with our own business agreement. Um, and so we, we set that minimum that we'll, we have an opportunity to change it every three years. That minimum is $400 minimum for a 40 minute set, um, which was you know, a far cry from what you know, is traditionally paid $100 or whatnot. Um, we also provide mental health care services at the festival. So look, I look at a music festival as a container for community care, right? Let's bring care resources to the party. And if we're gonna do that, the folks who should be paying for that are not necessarily our beer sponsors and our burrito makers, right? Like, like I love them, but I don't think they should be paying for the mental health care of Americans. And, and so we have gone to government sources and philanthropic sources to say, we wanna provide mental health care at our Festival. I've got 700 musicians there. I want to provide harm reduction supports, uh, sober supports. Um, and so we just, you know, centering the artists and then hospitality. And we learned a lot of that from Tree Fort. Um, just that hosp hospitable care where the artists don't feel commodified and they, they come in and you, you wrap them in a metaphorical warm blanket. And for us, that looks like a lot of like our artist care lounge, which was designed in partnership with Meow Wolf and offered classes and aromatherapy and goodies. And, you know, um, so I think, I think that's sort of been our philosophy. No, that's, yeah. that's excellent. And, and so many things there that I think can yeah. and should be replicated. And I should say for folks who aren't doing that, who are like, I run a music festival and I'm not doing that. And now I feel bad about myself. Listen, you can't do it without the government and philanthropic sources supporting you. You cannot sell enough tickets and beer to support the artists the way they need to be supported at our festivals. And so all of us need to sort of come together and say, these, what the future of the American Music Festival is a care container for Americans. And who pays for that? Government and philanthropy. So, yeah. Okay, so I definitely wanna follow up on that. But first, I wanna to get to Jamie Van Leeuwen uh, because you did something that's a little bit different than what happened on this side, right? So. 
Um, Sean and Aaron have shared a little bit about how they have used economic development to support the arts. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that your institute is using the arts to drive economic development. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that approach. Sure, I, I, I don't know that we did it so different as, as, as we, we kind of reversed the way it was being done. It's so fun. I think in the opening remarks today, I, I think the, 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 the important things that were coming together and kind of becoming a vehicle to kind of replicate things and doing them slightly differently than we've done them before and getting bolder and, 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 and innovative about how we approach things. And so the Global Livingston Institute's been around for 15 years. We're a best practices community development organization that operates in Uganda and Rwanda. We're rooted in the whole principles of listen and think before you go and act. Uh, and, and we did a lot of listening and thinking with the, the folks in the community. And obviously music is a huge part of that culture. Uh, and, and, and regardless of what community you are on the planet, and everybody in this room would agree with that, regardless of how rich or how poor you are or where you live or what community you're in, we love music, uh, and music um, can be an unbelievably great driver for social change and social impact, and it be a great driver for, for economic impact, but it can also um, find its way into how we uh, connect people with mental health services, public health services, and so getting into what Jamie's talking about, as we started to engage our artists in the community around um, in southern Uganda, in the rural communities that are really hard to reach, really underserved communities, those really hard to reach, underserved communities love music, and they have artists, and those artists are great clients to work with, and we have artists in the United States that want to be part of those communities and share that culture, and if you do that, you can find non-traditional ways to impact change. And so our music festivals, by bringing those artists together and hosting a concert in a community that never had a concert, that people never been invited to go to a concert before, um, our health providers all came to that concert with us and said as long as we're gonna provide the, these, these resources of, uh, of, of music and culture in this community, let's actually bring our health providers to the table to provide access to HIV testing and basic public health services. And over the years, as we started to develop that, we found that we could create this unbelievable vehicle that decreased stigma uh, that brought women and youth to the table to test for HIV uh, and access basic public health services in a way that we'd not done before. So the, the traditional way of, I'm gonna provide a, 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 a health clinic for you to come and get tested for HIV, Meh, who wants to go to a health clinic and get tested for HIV? Who wants to go to an awesome music festival um, and there happens to be HIV testing and access to basic health services that we can actually subsidize through the public health uh, and, 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 um, and public sector, but in a really non-traditional way. And so those music festivals, our last music festival in 2019, pre-COVID with Michael Franti, we had 40,000 people show up for a music festival in southern Uganda. Um, we are testing more people for HIV and connecting with services than the, the Ugandan government was that year. And so I think there's, there's ways that if we start working together and being in the room together and, and creating spaces like this, we can start thinking about how we do this work a little bit differently and get innovative and creative about how we leverage our resources and how we share ideas, regardless if you're in Boise, Idaho, or if you're in uh, Kabali, Uganda. Yeah. So. yeah, one thing about that really quickly is, again, I mean, Jamie, Jamie was sort of one of my models for taking this really intersectional approach. Anytime we're trying to do some sort of community work, and that's, Jamie and I kind of came up in that realm, right? Like public service community work. Um, what, do, what do organizers of health fair always ask for? They call the music folks and go, hey, can you send a musician over? Right, like we need something cool here, right? Like we are the cool. And so if our container can be the place that we push the resources into, I think that's the new model for community support and care. Um, it also allows us who historically have had a hard time leveraging funding to access all of these other greater pools of funding that aren't explicitly arts funding. And, and I'll just jump in real quick on that too, and I'm so glad you brought that up, Jamie, and Jamie about mental health and music. It's, uh, it's, it's something that's becoming part of the conversation here in Boise, and um, I know the, the Tree Fort Duck Club folks are, are thinking about that. I know we've had folks in the youth music community, um, Boise Hive, for example, thinking about this too, and when you're thinking about funding and you're thinking about partnerships, 
um, that's certainly something that uh, you know I, I think is critical and, and cannot be missed in in, um, in any community. And here in Boise, um, we're really looking at that as a, a way to approach mental health in a, in a new way and um, forming some of those partnerships around that intentionally. So, Aaron, I was going to ask you about what you think support for artists looks like at a local level, but I want to wrap this conversation around that and ask what's been your experience um, or your thoughts on supporting artists, not just financially, but emotionally, mentally? You know, it's odd that you've been talking about that in D.C., uh, the Office of Creative Affairs partnered with George Washington to do a thing called Care for Creatives. Mm. And it's a mental health uh, thing. Uh, each uh, uh, Georgetown has a, I believe, a clinical social work um, department they require to have so many hours. Every teaching hospital is required to do so many hours. And they were falling short of being able to meet those hours. Every hospital in every city, every university that has this program does has this problem, problem. So they decided to pair up with the Office of Creative Affairs to actually reach out to artists so that they could get the mental health support that they needed. I took advantage of that mm -hmm. during uh, the pandemic. I had forgotten when the pandemic hit, um, I was scheduled to do a, um, um, a, I was supposed to headline a festival in Normandy, France. And that week, everything went to hell. And um, over the next month, as an artist, it dawned on me that I did not know how to rehearse. I had been rehearsing for gigs, for people, for recordings, for events, for so on and so forth, but I had forgotten what made my heart sing as an artist. I did it because I just did it, and I was forced to sit alone, and I went through Care for Creatives, and we did a, it was a uh, Use Smart Goals, a six week, uh, a six -week uh, course, uh, and I had to sit in front of my piano after doing meditation and, a, and exercise and not touch it until I felt something inclined me to do so. And from that exercise came the Pride album. And, you know, the Pride album it has done considerably well, at least in the jazz world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that when we, we are trying to understand how to support the humanity of artists, this is what we're discussing around here. We, we talk about, we, we say so casually, we want to get like the, the, the minimum wage or being able to pay artists. This is the humanity. You, 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 I have been in rooms where I have seen $100,000 be raised in 10 minutes for this, that, and the other, but I don't get my check for six weeks and no one asks me how I'm paying my rent or the mental anguish that goes with not being able to know if you can get your teeth cleaned. Yeah. Or for heaven's sake, I'm single in 40. And I'm single in 40 because I knew as an artist, I could not afford a partner and or a child. Yeah. While I saw other people do it, you never, the argument is you'll never be able to afford children. That's what the, argue, the true argument is. But I knew that it was, would not be fair I know the stress I dealt with trying to afford myself yeah. and the mental anguish that goes with that. The, I'm a veteran, if I, hand, hands to God. If I was not a veteran of the United States Army I, and have access to health care, I would not have been able to be a full-time artist all these years. Anytime I've gotten sick or need to go to the emergency room or needed some medication at a very reduced rate or a comparable rate, I've been able to go to a VA given I get sick in a, in a city where there is a VA, yeah. Yeah. you know? So we in government, if some of you knew the roadblocks to get the access and care and the finances and the money, so that we get this money to you to support you from a public side, a, a public a point, a point of view, you you would you really would appreciate the work. I newly appreciate the work of those who sit in my seat now, or oh, beforehand, of what they had to go to to get the grants out the door. But we in government, and you as the population, need to demand from your council people, your legislators, your your governor, uh, your mayors. You need to demand that the the humanity of artists is considered. It wasn't until the pandemic that being a musician or an artist was considered an insurable 
source of employment. It's the first time we ever got unemployment insurance. One of the reasons why we look at tours with mixed bags, you just got off a tour, right? Something you said I caught on to, you said for the next two months, you don't know, you know, not that you don't know what you're gonna do, but you're not gonna be doing anything. Do you know the type of depression that comes with leaving a tour? It is PTSD. It's, it's the, the exact same equivalent of having a racing train that abruptly stops. And you have to make sense of your life. The last tour that I went, went on, I was on tour in Russia during the, pan, during the invasion. And it took me three months to get my mind together again. And I reached out to partners to say, you may not understand what I'm going through, but I need some support and help of some sort. So I think we, what you're doing, that I wrote it down. I think creating a line item for those of us in government to say, hey, you know, if, you, if there's festivals that we're supporting or if there's events we in government are doing where we're going to have a great draw of people, let's make sure we have a tent there where mental health stuff is being offered and uh, massages or aromatherapy or something is being offered in this particular moment. But we're really talking about the humanity of people, the, mo the reason why you have artists that do drugs and hard drugs, drugs, I can tell you there is no other feeling that matches after you just completed a show and you actually connected with your audience. And then you go home alone and no one understands what you just felt. That is heavy. I have lived it. And then to go home sometimes alone by yourself you are, you're trying to find something to fill that gap. And then on top of that, if you just connected with this great audience of sometimes a thousand people or more, and you get home and you still are broke, or you don't have the options to eat what you would just like to eat, or you don't feel well, but you don't know if you can go to the doctor, but you just made thousands of people connect and fall in love again and grieve and feel good and celebrate, it's the humanity that we're charged. We're charged with making sure that we do not forget humanity. That's what our jobs are. That's our jobs. I want to I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing. That's a pretty powerful uh, experience. One of the things you said early on was, if I had not served in the U.S. Army, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to afford care. And I want to turn it over to Jamie and Jamie, um, because both of you have, what was the language you used, Jamie? You use your festival as a container for care. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know that that's been a really big focus of yours as well, and you started to talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. We only have about four minutes left, maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, I want to, what I want to challenge you with is, I think a lot of what we're talking about really is the purview of government, um, maybe philanthropy, mm -hmm. right? Why are you, as a festival organizer, um, tasked with executing care for people? So mm -hmm. how, how have you addressed that? Well, I'll start briefly, because uh, I actually, the interesting thing and what makes music festivals so amazing, and I think we need to think about it, Jamie's been talking about this in Colorado, and, and we need to think about uh, uh, music festivals from a, a, a different light, is that we're actually, the Global Livingston Institute, we're a community development organization. We're designed to engage yeah. with community and connect and create a space for fo folks around sustainability and education and public health. And, and music festivals became this unbelievably great vehicle for us to do that. And so our artists became our clients, that, that there is other ways to reach people for mental health services and HIV testing than just a, a day clinic or basic services that we've kind of done same old, same old. We said, well, let's use, let's make artists our clients and let's bring people to the table and connect them. And, and as a result of that, we've had a huge economic development impact. The economic development impact comes from paying artists to come to these communities that they've never been to and engaging the communities and hiring all the locals to help set up the stage and to engage folks. And so we kind of did it in a reverse. And it's really exciting, and I think that, that, that hopefully what comes out of today is that there's so many different ways to engage and, and, and deploy this. 
And the most important part of that is, is, is that humanity piece of, of the artists, but also of the communities that we're working and we're serving, and there's different ways to approach it. Yeah. I mean, I think Jamie and I have a similar approach in that um, I just don't want to leave anything on the table. You know, we, just, we do that too much in government, in community, in the arts. And so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that everybody has to take that approach, but I would feel... Uh, like, I'm not doing my job as a community uh, organizer if I'm not looking at every single resource and bringing that to the table and every single thing that I do. And so I do think there's a benefit in as we're organizing work. I think even look at this group up here. Like, there's a real benefit in having diverse intersectional uh, career experiences when you are organizing events um, and community initiatives, right? You need artists at the table, you need policy wonks at the table, you need community organizers at the table, you need folks who have... I was telling somebody the other day, I think we need to start seeing ourselves as our own sort of army of special forces and we need to be placed in every single area in our economy, in our world. And so to say somebody who works for the government isn't doing the same work as somebody who works for a nonprofit, or, you know, like I think we need to suspend some judgment there and say, actually, we're all a part of the same special forces, but you're just stationed here, and you're stationed here, and you're stationed here. And so I think that's, that's just my approach is, I, d I just don't wanna leave one more thing on the table when it comes to taking care of people. Well, Jimmy, I um, was just making some notes for a summary argument, but I think you just made it for me. So okay. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> this has been a great discussion. And like Ashley, I'm going to say, I wish we had another couple of hours to continue. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.